Hi, good afternoon, everybody. First thing, shake off the food coma from lunch, okay? Shake it off. Nobody fall asleep on me. Um, my name's Steve Arusa. Um, I've sp spent, uh, I got a little bit of military, law enforcement, and fire service experience. Um, I spent 25 years in the Chicago metro area, and I'm currently the fire chief in Fisher's Rights outside Indiana. Um, first of all, I want to thank you. I really appreciate that you're here today. I know you have a lot of choices of how to spend your time, and uh, you choose to be here, so that means a lot to me. Um, this slide has some significance for me um, because I've screwed this up. And hopefully today, I'm going to share with you the mistakes and the blood, sweat, and tears of uh, my experiences as a company officer and how they've led to me to be, to be fire chief and that hopefully you'll feel comfortable enough to share your experiences so that all of us at the end of an hour will have maybe just a few tools in our toolbox, our leadership toolbox, to serve that the people that we love, our firefighters and the community that we serve. Um, my first exposure to fire service leadership happened before I even got into the fire service. Um, don't hold it against me, I was a cop. Wanted to be a cop my whole life. Um, got a Bachelor of Science in Law Enforcement, went to Chicago Police Academy, graduated the Police Academy, and I was a cop for about 18 months. And in college, I took one fire department test. And lo and behold, after 18 months of being a police officer, they said, hey, come on down and be a firefighter. And my roommate was a firefighter paramedic, and he got to do all this neat stuff that I did not get to do. So I said, can I come down to the fire department and talk to somebody and learn about the job? Because all I knew was what my roommate told me. And I was introduced to the deputy chief of operations. His name was Ron, Ron Culpert. And he sat me down in his office. And what was great about that experience is how patient he was with me, how he listened to my anxiety, my concerns, uh, my worries about changing a career and not being able to go backward. And he told me, he said, you need to make a decision that's good for you and your family because that's what's going to be good for the fire department. And I really appreciated that. And how many deputy chiefs are going to bring a recruit, much less a recruit that's a police officer, in his office and sit down and take time and counsel and coach him on leadership in his future? So <laughs> evidently I got on the fire department and never looked back. First day on duty, and we all know how it is, bring five dozen donuts, come in, watch everybody, but the interesting thing for me was is to watch the interaction between the firefighters and other firefighters and then the firefighters and officers and to start picking out as a young recruit firefighter who I wanted to emulate. I want to be like that guy. I don't want to be like that. And what I could grab and put in my toolbox to start my career to be the best firefighter paramedic I could be. Um, and then, eight years later, I take my first promotional test. And uh, I'm the man, right? I studied, I did the assessment center, I went to all the schools, I prepared, I wanted to beat everybody. And I was blessed enough to be number one on the list. And I got a letter from the chief's office and I knew there was a pending retirement and I said, man, this could be it. So I go into the bathroom in the stall and I sit down by myself and I open that letter and lo and behold, it was a promotional letter. And I was excited. And then I exited the bathroom to all the 12 guys at my firehouse laughing and congratulating me because they knew I was going to get the letter before I did. So much for confidentiality at the chief secretary. So, so, but how do you think I felt after I read that letter? Anybody? Scared? Good? Right? I felt pretty good, you know? I'd studied, I'd worked hard, I'd be the best firefighter I, I could be over the past eight years, and I was like, you know, called my wife up, baby, I made it, you know? I made it, I'm number one on the list, I'm gonna get promoted. But what didn't I realize? I hadn't really made it, had I? I'd kinda had it. Because what happens, happened the next day when everybody knew that I was getting promoted to lieutenant? You think that changed any of my relationships with my friends, my fellow firefighters? How do you think they changed? Yeah, all of a sudden I was one of them. I wasn't Steve, the firefighter paramedic on truck 31. I was one of them. I was going to be a boss, you know. And then some of my friends, some of my colleagues were aggravated because they thought they deserved to be promoted and I didn't. So much for feeling really good about myself and becoming a company officer. So I had a lot to learn. 
So this next video clip accurately represents my first experience as a company officer. Yep. Okay, in case any of you are confused, the little antelope running its butt off, that's me. And the lions ready to eat me are the people above me in the food chain and the people below me in the food chain. The firefighters and the chiefs and the officers. Um, all the lieutenants uh, on my department had to go to headquarters station for their first year under the tutelage of someone who I will affectionately call Captain Granite from the School of Hard Knocks. And his job was to take you as a fresh lieutenant and mold you into something that they could send out into the companies, not under the protection of headquarters station, and that you could function. So Captain Granite set me down the first day, and he said, uh, why should you be a lieutenant? I was like, what do you mean, why should I be a lieutenant? I wrote the score, I did the assessment center, I've been good for eight years. When everybody else was screwing off, I had my nose to the grindstone. He goes, you, you think that qualifies you to be a company officer and a good leader? I says, yeah, it did, I worked my butt off for it. And he taught me something really important. He taught me that being the best firefighter doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna be the best officer or the best leader. He told me that there's a whole nother skill set that you need to develop before you become a good leader and a good officer. And he told me it's not about you, which totally confused me. And one of the things he taught me that I'll never forget was that, first thing he said, he says, you can't do anything by yourself. He said, the first thing you need to do is create and maintain relationships. And I said, what the heck does that mean? He said, you have all these grandiose ideas about what you're going to do as a company officer. I did this to get myself promoted. I am going to do this as a company officer. He says, what's the inoperative word in your vocabulary? And that finally hit me, I. He said, you're going to have to create internal relationships, relationships inside your company, inside your fire station. He says, you've got a credibility savings and loan, and you've got to put deposits in that credibility savings and loan. He said, and earn the respect and acceptance of your company. And then hopefully, one day, they'll be able to take their shoes off and put your shoes on and give you some empathy and acceptance when you've got to make a tough decision. He says, but you've got to earn that. He said, and then you've got to make relationships externally. He goes, you can't do anything without the support of the department, without the support of your superior officers. So that credibility savings and loan has got to be built up the food chain as well as down the food chain. And he said a common mistake that people make is that they may start and create relationships, but they don't maintain them. He says it's like a plant. You got to water it, you got to feed it. And you've got to revisit those individuals and maintain that credibility savings and loan. And he said, you know what? You're not perfect. One day, you're going to make a mistake. And you're going to have to with, make a big withdrawal of that credibility savings and loan. And if you did it right, it's not going to bankrupt your career. He also taught me about integrity, to do what's right. And he told me it was going to be really hard, and I had no idea what he meant until they cut me loose outside to the companies. He says, doing what's right's got to be his own reward. Don't expect applause. Don't expect thank you cards. He says, you're not going to be able to go to the bowling tournament all the time. You're not going to go to the barbecue. You're not going to be able to have a beer on the weekend at your friend's house like you used to. Sometimes you're going to have to make tough choices. And he said, part of doing what's right is not you doing it, it's listening. Listen, listen, and listen again to your people. Because if you're listening, it functions as prevention. You can pick up cues and clues that something's wrong in your company by listening before it becomes a disaster on the fire ground. He says, listening is the most important compliment that you can pay another person. 
and none of us do enough of it, especially a new company officer. He also taught me to prepare my people to be successful or be prepared to rescue them from their incompetencies. He says, you've got a covenant with your firefighters to prepare them to be as safe and effective as possible because when you commit them to harm's way, you commit their families to harm's way. And that's a huge responsibility. It's not only a huge responsibility for the company officer, but everybody else up the food chain. He talked about manual labor versus emotional labor. He goes, Steve, you're really good at manual labor. You can get water the fastest. You could chop the hole in the roof the fastest. You could start the, the, the saw the fastest. He said, but there's a whole other skill set you don't know, emotional labor. How many of us here signed up for emotional labor? Not me, man. I signed up to ride a fire truck and rescue people. Emotional labor, HR crap, uh-uh. Documentation? No, no, I didn't learn that in the fire academy. He said there's, gonna, there's an operational hazard zone and the management hazard zone. He says you've got to be able to function in both. An operational hazard zone, he says you've got it down. Your CBA alarm goes off, five blows on the air horn, you've got to get out of the collapsing building. He goes, you've got that dialed in. He says, but there's also the management hazard zone where no bells or alarms goes off. He says you've got to ne learn to negotiate the time, the 90% of the time that you're in the station and you're not on the fire ground or rescue ground. He also told me that tactically there are going to be people that will save your life in the station, but they'll kill you with their bare hands. True story, huh? You go, we go. On the fire ground, trench rescue, water rescue, I'm your brother or sister, I'll do anything for you. Take my Snickers bar, I'll kill you with my bare hands in the station. And there's stuff that will kill us biologically, but also stuff that will kill us organizationally. And you have to spend as much time listening to your people, coaching, counseling, documenting things as you do preparing to be in the hazard zone. And what do you think I thought? Send me back to the companies as a firefighter, right? Life was so much simpler. So as a company officer, he told me, I'm going to have to balance the rules and the culture as the leader. And we all know what rules are, don't we? Rules are the policies, procedures. A lot of times they have a person's name attached to them. Um, and you've got to be perceived as a leader as being affected by both the firefighters and the bosses and the officers. And that's hard to balance that from both directions. Because what's the culture? The culture is the beliefs, values, and attitudes of your company, of your station, of your fire department. Are they always the same or are they the same ever? No, they can be different. People are as different as snowflakes. So how do we manage that culture? How do we manage rules? And then there's going to come a moment of truth in your career when it's going to be family, de family practice versus department practice, and you're going to have to make a decision. And that decision is going to affect the rest of your credibility as an officer on the fire department. He told me that in our consensus building society, there is great pressure to go along with the crowd. The path to wisdom is out, and the path to conformity is in. Peer pressure can change us. What if it does? What if you sweep that problem under the carpet, and one day you're stepping over it, the next day you climb over it, and the next day it blows the lid off your fire station? Or worse yet, it blows the lid off of something in the hazard zone. He says, you're going to have to make a choice. And I kept finding him, and I said, man, this is hard. Why is this so hard? And I want to take you on a visit back to Psychology 101, and we all know Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's a good pictorial to describe what we all need as people. But I think it's especially important we discuss firefighters because it can give us cues and clues to how we can be a more effective company officer and why it is so hard to have family practice versus department practice and some of those cultural habits that are unhealthy. So if we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, on the basis the physiological needs, bear with me for a few minutes, and that's the base of the pyramid. It's important to understand that you can't go up the pyramid until you go to the base and work your way up. So let's use primitive man as an analogy in this example. Primitive man is hungry, right? He's in his cave. 
He's so hungry it drives him outside his cave to hunt the Macedon. Now hunting the Macedon is pretty dangerous, but he's willing to risk his life because he's hungry. So he kills the Macedon, he eats his fill, and he's good to go. He's back in his cave. Now he's free to go up the next level of the pyramid to safety. Man, every time I'm hungry, I don't want to kill that Macedon, so I'm going to take that Macedon, I'm going to cure it for later consumption and store it in my cave, so that way I don't have to risk my life as much. Now he's met his safety needs. Next, his need for acceptance. Man, I get pretty bored eating Macedon by myself in the cave, so I'm going to invite the other people on the block in their caves to come and share the Macedon with me. His need for acceptance is met. Next, self-esteem. I'm so sick of eating Macedon, I'm going to experiment with various ways to barbecue it, cure it, salt it, and share it with my friends. And last but not least, on the wall of his cave, he paints a th him killing a thousand Macedons by himself. Self-actualization. So if we take this example and we apply it to firefighters, as firefighters, do we grow our own food? Do we make our own clothes? No. We got grocery stores, we got uniform shops. Safety needs, right? We've got bargaining unit agreements, we've got NFPA, we've got NIOSH, <clears throat> we've got PPE, we've got policies and procedures. So what becomes the bottom of our pyramid? Our need for acceptance. So it's no wonder where is a company officer most vulnerable? And our need for acceptance. Anybody experience that? Anybody have anything to share on that? All of a sudden you go to the coffee table and no one talks to you? All of a sudden your bunk is moved out of the bunk room onto the apparatus floor? Happens, right? We all know. We all know lots of stories like that. But there's good news, Captain Granite told me. He goes, your leadership has to be value-driven and mission-focused. And I'm like, oh, no, more psychology 101. He goes, no, it's simple. He goes, you've got to decide yourself what do you stand for. Next, after you identify what you stand for, how do you resolve conflict as an officer and a leader? And next, what drives you? In my fire department, um, we're a young department. We're only 20 years old full-time. We just had our first retiree. And I'm going to be honest with you, when I got there four years ago, we had some bad cultural habits. We didn't have the benefit of 150 years of tears, of sweat, of blood, and learning from all those experiences. We were only 20 years old, and we were, we were 150. So we exploded. So we didn't have the whiskers. We didn't have the benefit. And we're a slow fire department. We're a new community, new construction, with a lot different hazards than what I'm used to being from Chicago. So what we did was is we did a comprehensive values audit in our fire department. I met with every single person in the organization and I sat down one on one and I mainly listened. And I asked them two questions. One is, what do we do to help you do your job better? And two, what values are gonna drive us into the future? And they looked at me and they said, what are values? And I said, what do we stand for? How do we resolve conflict and what drives us forward? And I took notes. And they, each of them gave me four values. We took those values, we identified and defined what they were. We had workshops on values, and then we did the survey monkey. We sent them out, and they voted on what values were going to answer those questions. Honesty, integrity, professionalism, and accountability. And I didn't vote. Why didn't I vote? Because they're theirs, right? They own them. They're on the wall in the stations, and they set expectations for how they interact with each other. They set expectations for how they interact with our customer and our community. And when somebody violates those expectations, who polices that? They do. And they do a good job, and they're getting better at it. Quick story. It's football season, and we run ALS, Advanced Life Support Paramedic Service. We've got to deal with the hospitals that we do hospital, hospital transports when it's a, a significant case. So my EMS division chief gives me a call and says, man, I got the ER physician and the staff at the ER is all mad at our guys. I says, what's the problem? Um, they were rude to the patient. They were rude to the staff. They were rude to the ER doc. And it's a Sunday and it's a football Sunday. So it doesn't take a moron as fire chief to figure out what happened, right? 
They probably got the call during the game, right? They're doing brunch, and they don't feel like doing the hospital hospital transport. But being a good fire chief, I want to get my facts first and not assume. So I bring them in. I says, you know, let me talk to them. So they came in and they told me the situation. You know, we've been getting abused with these hospital hospital transports. It was Sunday. We were doing this. We were doing that. We, 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 we. And I sat them down, and behind them in my office was our mission and our values, which they had a hand in writing. And I said, you guys remember our values? Whew, thank goodness they did, right? Because that would have been embarrassing. So I said, if you would have went on that call and were value-driven and mission-focused, and you would have came and told your company officer to document what happened that the hospital was abusing our hospital hospital transports and the division chief it would have made it up to my desk and guess what I would have done I would have been on the ER physicians back on that but instead you're in my office and I'm on your back see what happens when you're not value driven and mission focused and you should have seen the light bulb go on it can work next the mission focus part what do we do who are we and how do we do it? We did not write a mission statement that is a thorough like NASA. Nobody knows what it means. We did not do what they did 10 years ago and hire an HR professional to do a workshop on mission statements and values. We all sat down at a strategic planning conference and I paid them and I fed them and I said, what's our mission? Answer those questions. And they did a wonderful job of writing it. And they're living it. Because if something bad happens, if we get somebody significantly injured, or God forbid we have a line of duty death, and our fire service house blows down, what's the foundation that's going to hold us together? Being value-driven and mission-focused. We can always come back to that, and we can always push forward, because we got to hold on to that. And then we can rebuild that fire service house, because it's on a firm foundation. Captain Granite also told me three things. He said, your leadership is going to require responsibility. It's going to require authority and accountability. I said, yeah, so? He goes, well, what do those mean? And obviously I got him wrong. He says, the chief's given you the responsibility as a company officer to work within an area of freedom to manage your company and lead them in the harm's way and to lead them in the management hazard zone. He's also giving you the authority to get those things done in your job description. He says he's also making you accountable for that. He says, what I want to teach you is that responsibility and authority can be, can be delegated. Accountability can't. So when you're on a ladder and you got, you got rooftop ventilation and you don't get the roof open and that attack company gets driven out of the building, you can't say it's my firefighter's fault. If something worse happens and I'm the incident commander and I gave you that responsibility and something goes south and we have a significant injury or civilian death, I can't say it was your fault as a truck company officer. I can't delegate that accountability. And if we have something worse and the press and the policymakers go to the fire chief, he can't say it was the incident commander's problem. He did, the, he, it's his bad. No, you can't delegate accountability. Accountability does not come a la carte. I know a lot of people that have been promoted and they're like, man, give me a double helping of salary. Give me a double helping of authority. Give me the shiny new uniform. But that accountability stuff, man, that's a la carte. I didn't order that. No, it comes with the territory. The good news is that 90% of the negative stuff that can happen to a company officer won't happen if you act like a servant leader. That's the good news. Managing in that 90% means you lead by example, right? You have to set the benchmark. You have to set the performance standard as a company officer. You can't do as I say, not as I do. We have a great tradition in the fire service. We can tell the fans from the players a mile away, can't we? We got a guy comes in and teaches a class and doesn't walk the walk and talk the talk. We can spot who that is. Guy talking smack around the coffee table, we know who they are. We know the fans from the players. And believe me, firefighters know the officers from the leaders. 
mostly coaching. Most of our people want to do a good job. We are blessed in the fire service. Communicate effectively, critical listening. That means get the facts. The grapevine, the rumor mill, rely on formal communication. Be competent and job smart. Obviously, don't stop training, don't start educating. I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here. Address issues immediately and correctly. As a company officer, if you hit a tack in with a sledgehammer, what happens? Your people lose trust? Oh, yeah. They withdraw from you, okay? You've got to use the right amount of management and address issues correctly, and you've got to do it immediately. Because if you hit a tack in with a sledgehammer, they don't trust you. They withdraw. They won't communicate with you. But if you don't address it at all, they don't trust you either, right? They know what's going on in the fire station. They're waiting for you to do something, and you don't do it. And love your people always. Let them know that there's enough praise to go around. Let's not wait for a line of duty death, a serious injury, or a retirement party to tell our people we do a good job. Tell them every day they do something. They are ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and they do it on a daily basis. And not only do they do it on a daily basis, when they're not doing it, they're preparing themselves to do it. Then there's the other 10%. 5% you, you can handle in-house, which means, guess what? You're going to have to do stuff you don't like. You're going to have to document. You're going to go back to that management hazard zone and look at the books and start documenting poor performance, try to modify behavior. The other 5%, you're going to lead a whole lot of organizational support. Hostile work environment, sexual harassment, addictive behavior, stealing, guys with family problems. You're going to have to reach out to HR, reach out to other officers, your mentors, and reach out to the command staff to help you. And you can't be afraid to do that because that's not saying that you didn't do a good job. You're doing your job. He taught me about the leadership bar. I said, how do I know when? How do I know what's the 90% and the 5% and the other 5%? He goes, this is your bar. He goes, you're going to have people that voluntarily, voluntarily comply. They exceed standards. They're promotable. They couldn't imagine themselves doing anything else but firefighting and they have a passion for what they do. He said, those people you handle with counseling and coaching skills. You provide them education, you provide them training, you provide them mentoring. He says, below that bar are people with disruptive attitudes, voluntary noncompliance, people who are bad on purpose. Those who are what I call losers. He says, that's when you need assertive skills, documentation skills, because if you've got a true cancer in your group, the only way to remove that cancer was with a scalpel, and documentation is your scalpel. Because if you go to your boss and you've got a problem, and you don't have the documentation to support your case, that firefighter is going to come in and say, Sir, I don't understand. I think it's a personal issue. Where's the documentation to support all these claims and I'm not doing a good job? In fact, in my performance evaluation, I was ambushed. I didn't hear about any of this stuff until my performance evaluation. Don't you think I should have heard about it so I could improve my performance before my performance evaluation? True story happened to me. Should have listened to Captain Granite a little more. Use discretionary time. I loved uh, Chief Compton's presentation this morning. He said something that struck me. Don't do anything that feels good, right? There are wild woes in the fire service if you go by that principle. How many of us have hit the send button and said, oh, no, I have many times. My new rule is I fire up that email, the keys are burning up, I wait till the next day before I hit that send button because I've done a lot of, not a lot of good things. Discretionary time, get the facts. We use size up in the operational hazard zone all the time. We gotta start using size up in the management hazard zone. Don't rush into an HR problem not knowing your stuff because you can burn yourself and the fire department and the loser gets to keep his job. Here's an example of someone who did not use discretionary time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Hold up. Let's 
келе. That's what I affectionately call the Polish polar bear punch. <laughs> and I'm Polish, so. Okay, discretionary time. He said there are red and green issues. He goes, this is the simplest way I can describe them to you. He says, something that immediately affects customer service, something that's dangerous, violates safety practice, or something that's going to put us on the front page, you got to stop it and you got to act right away. That buys you discretionary time. That buys you time to get the facts. That mitigates the danger to your personnel, to the community, and to your organization. The other stuff is green. Take your time, get the facts, get help if you need to. Be patient and understanding and exercise compassion. Love your people always. Discretionary time and personal issues. Don't overreact and don't do anything that feels good. Gotta love Chief Compton. Think about the amount of management time needed. If you've got what's below that bar, you've got voluntary noncompliance, you've got someone who's bad on purpose, reach out because you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. Get your facts straight, get an appropriate action plan. One of the worst things I did, I had a guy who was out of shape. I was a new officer, I was in shape, I was a comma challenge freak. And um, so he comes to me, he's overweight, and he goes, Lou, man, I need, I need a, a fitness thing. I, I, I gotta lose weight, I, I gotta feel better in my breathing apparatus. So I gave him my workout. How do you think that went over? <laughs> right? He couldn't do my workout. In fact, he got frustrated trying to do it and he gave up. Instead of reaching out to the pure fitness trainers, reaching out to local, reaching out to um, people that could do a fitness plan that met his needs. Okay? A little bit of ego there on my part. Address issues in a well-timed manner and talk to someone if you're not sure what to do. Timeliness is important. There's nothing more frustrating in a company than if one of the company members is doing something over and over and over again. The company officer has his head in the sand and doesn't address it. Trust. Trust and communication goes out the door. Make humility a priority. This is my bad. If, we, if decisions didn't be made and problems didn't need to be solved, we wouldn't need leaders, right? But if you, when, when you're a new officer and you make some good decisions and you solve some problems, people start saying, hey, man, good job. You get that pat on the back, right? Hey, another good job and another good job, and pretty soon, guess what? Hey, man, I'm good at this stuff, and I'm new. This is kind of cool. I like this. And you know what happens? All of a sudden, you're addicted to your own ego, and you're serving yourself instead of your community and your people. Ego suppression is, an, is, is a valuable tool in my toolbox. I've got what I call the, the, the ego jungle, where they're in this pit. There's, they're in the pit, there's spiders and snakes and all that stuff you hate about what's in the jungle, and there's a balance beam. And I did a few good things. I'm walking across that balance beam, make it across the pit. Then I do something else good, and I'm skipping across it. Then I'm running across it, and I fall down inside that pit. And I look up and I say, how the heck did I get here? You know how I got here? Because I was chasing my own ego. Self-promotion pride and self-protection fear, a recipe for disaster as a company officer. When you run a team without a clear purpose, your leadership becomes self-focused. Man, I hate those calls. It's my workout time. It's dinner time. It's my sleep time. It's my training time. Why do we exist? What happened to being value-driven and mission-focused? How about as a fire chief? Man, I like going to the political functions. I like the VIP treatment. I like going to the dinners. I like being in the media, even though I got a PIO. This is something that's my bed that I've had to deal with and I've had to learn the hard way.
Again, this is the USS Montana requesting that you immediately divert your course 15 degrees to the north to avoid a collision. Over. Please divert your course 15 degrees to the south to avoid collision. This is Captain Hancock. You will divert your course. Over. Negative, Captain. I'm not moving anything. Change your course. Over. <laughs> Sir. This is the USS Montana, the second largest vessel in the North Atlantic Fleet. You will change course 15 degrees north, or I will be forced to take measures to ensure the safety of this ship. Over! This is the lighthouse, mate. It's your call. Hello? Captain? I think he's gone. Fair enough. A little bit of ego there, I'd say, right? So I soon realized that, I wish I could get rid of that little thing, there we go, that I had a pride problem, okay? After I graduated from being with Captain Granite, they put me at a station, <clears throat> probably the biggest ladder company in the city, and I had the union president, the senior apparatus operator, and the secretary treasurer of the union at that station. Talk about being thrown to the wolves, right? and things were going pretty good. They were going so good that I got named company officer of the year, which doesn't mean squat, but I thought it meant something back then. Um, and I realized I thought I was all that. And I had a pride problem. Instead of being dependent on my people, I became independent because I thought I had all the answers. Instead of collaborating, instead of harnessing the creative resources of the group, and what a great group I had, right? the senior apparatus operator, the union president, the secretary treasurer, instead of using those guys as a resource, I competed with them. Instead of being compassionate, I became critical, right? Justice, justice, not forgiveness and reconciliation, the blame game. And instead of being gracious, when they got attention and they got credit, they got praise and recognition and the awareness of the company was noticed in the city, I became envious. And finally, where before I was approachable and there was trust and communication and they would come to me with stuff that I needed to know, now I was like a leper. So my pride problem was really a priority problem. Pride is demanding to be served, and your humility is surrendering to serve others. I had to realize the hard way that it wasn't about me. Pride and grace cannot dwell in the same place. I was an ego-driven officer, and I didn't realize being an ego-driven officer that your people are gonna think, get, not going to get things right all the time. Nobody's perfect. Not even the officer. Ego-driven leaders are impatient for, for, that are quick for results, are quick to judge and discount those efforts, rather to forgive and redirect. The blame game. As a service-driven company officer, when you forgive, you in no way change the past, but you sure do change the future. It's not evidence we don't have what it takes. It's food for development. And it was my responsibility as a company officer to facilitate that. Not be the decision maker, not be the problem solver, but facilitate problem solving decision making. So it wasn't one person thinking for everybody. It was everybody thinking for the team, and I failed. Whenever I go up to see my parents in Chicago, I see some of my college mates and my high school buddies. And some of them are very successful. They're attorneys. They have seats on the board of trade. They make big money. And uh, more often than not, some of them tell me, you know what, I should have been a firefighter. Right? I should have been a firefighter. And I think that some of what the public believes about us, and it's true in my opinion, is that we've chosen the heroic path. But there was two ways down that path, and I went the wrong way. I was worried about self-promotion and pride, okay? 
self-protection and fear. I was more worried about keeping my job than doing my job. Not leading at great personal risk, not being an advocate for my people. My self-worth and security was so wrapped up into my collar pin, I forgot what I was there for. And I thought I was being a hero. I forgot what my belief system was, to be value-driven and mission-focused. Dedicated to a cause and a relationship, not to lead out of self-promotion pride or lead out of self-protection fear, not chasing what other people thought of me or my own job performance, but dedicated to the people I had a covenant with to keep safe in harm's way and to serve the community. And I realized that I had gifts and that I was not being a good steward of those gifts. And then I had a season of leadership. That leadership position wasn't mine, no matter if I was a lieutenant, on a truck company, or a fire chief. I was given gifts and I was given an opportunity for a season of leadership, and it's not gonna last forever. There's not gonna be pyramids built with my name on it, but what I do in that season is what's important. And I can't waste any of it making it about me. So as a company officer, are you a servant leader or a self-serving leader? I ask myself three questions on a regular basis. How do I handle feedback? When I was self-serving, you know how I handled feedback? I handled it as a threat. Because my self-worth and security was so wrapped up on being boss that any time someone tried to give me constructive criticism, I thought they didn't want me to be the boss. I was personalizing it. I forgot why I was there. How do I handle successor planning? People that are coming up the pipe, am I developing them? Or am I nurturing them? They're diamonds in the rough in our industry. Or am I keeping them at arm's length? Because I'm afraid they're going to get some of the praise and attention and I won't get it. The true test of my ability as a fire chief is how my department functions when I'm not there. In any leadership level, the company officer, when there's a new officer in, temporarily, the true test of how they, if they need you to be successful, you're not doing your job. I'm a fire chief from outside of the community I serve. If I, when I leave, they don't have five to six people ready to take my place. If they need an outside fire chief, I should be fired. Because it's part of my job. What is my perspective on who leads and who follows? Are the sheep there for the benefit of the shepherd? Or the other way around? And that's what you are as a company officer. You're taking care of your people in the community. And the families of those firefighters trust you to do that. That's a huge responsibility. Managing the attitude of entitlement. A lot of people say, oh, there's this generation, there's that generation. And for me, I'm a simple guy, I'm boilerplate. Um, I'm a blue collar guy. So I, I lump them all into the, mag the attitude of entitlement generation. And one of the things I learned is don't be put off by our overt ambition. Let's face it, the new generation of firefighter and paramedic is gonna inherit what we have. And every generation before us said, oh man, look at what's coming up the pike. How are they going to handle what we handled so well? Well, they're all we got. And you know what? They're as ego-driven as we were. There's really no difference. So don't be put off by overt ambition. I go to recruit 
uh, graduations. And the first thing I hear is, oh, chief, chief, I want to be in special operations. I want to be in special operations. I want to be in hazmat, water rescue, USAR. Guess what? Special operations is special for a reason, right? There's this thing called seniority and experience. You know, you haven't even learned to pull off a, an attack line and fight a fire yet, and you want to be in special operations. So I learned, don't be put off by that overt envision. When they come to the fire station and they want to do everything, man, that's a gift. Nurture it. Coach them. Counsel them. Because they're going to inherit what we have when we're gone, and that's our legacy. Don't confuse with ambition with ability. Made a mistake. Pump operators off, engineers off. Young guys, who can pump the engine? Oh, I can, I can. Guess what, he couldn't pump the engine. Found out at the fire though, right? They'll tell you they can do a lot of things, but their fans are not players. Don't put them in a position where they're gonna fail for you or the community. You need to address challenges on an individual basis with them. Nobody likes to be disciplined in public. Nobody likes to be embarrassed. No shotgun effect. How many, how many guys ever experienced, yeah, we could pull our POVs in, wax them and wash them. In the wintertime, everybody's got to be out by 6 a.m. One guy out of 1,500 does not pull his vehicle out at 0600. All right, everybody can never pull their car into the fire station again to wash it. True story. Problem-solving decision-making is discussion-based, not status-based. Can I make people do things with this collar pin? Absolutely. Can I make them value-driven and mission-focused and make them the best they can be? Absolutely not. They'll hate me, and guess what? Today's firefighter is transient. I'm one of them. Worked for nine different fire chiefs. So when you have good people, hang on to them, nurture them, give them what they need. And hazing and rank is not effective anymore. Doesn't work. Lawsuits, hostile work environment. It, they want ownership. They want involvement. They want to participate. And some of them have great ideas. All you got to do is sit down and listen to them. Don't discourage them. Don't kill their motivation. Realize that they're your legacy. Children want power so they can be of somebody. We have to teach them not to raise their self-esteem by damaging someone else's. All of us know the guys in the fire service who their fire service career ladder has a name on the rungs of the guys they worked with. That's not how we want them to get ahead. Don't be discontented for what you have because you're jealous of what someone else has. Don't use the formula of I'm gonna make people look bad so I can look better by comparison. Company officers want power so they can serve somebody. Let's build people, not programs. Let's be value-driven and mission-focused and use our belief system. I've learned that I've got two selves. I've got an internal self that can be very self-reflective, and I've got an external self. And that external self gets up at 4.30 in the morning, works out, goes to the office before, two hours before my staff, and gets more done in two hours, and then I can deal with all the policymakers after that. And I do it Monday through Friday on autopilot. But I've learned that if I don't spend time with my internal self and my belief system, what happens? I fall off that ego's anonymous bandwagon, and I start making it all about me again. If you take a look at this flower, it's very pretty, it smells good, people like to be around it, people like to get flowers, but then if you take it out of a plot, pot and you look at what's beneath, it doesn't smell pretty, it's dirty, nobody wants to deal with it. What's beneath the surface of the Class A uniform? What's beneath the surface of the t-shirt? What's beneath the surface of the job shirt, the Reuben? What's beneath the surface? In disaster management, you guys all know this, we have situation status reports, okay? That's in the emergency, where have we been, where are we at, and where are we going? I've learned that I need to do my own personal situation status report on a regular basis. I need to revisit my belief system and I do it this way. First, I look at where I'm at mentally. 
Am I value-driven and mission-focused? How do I resolve conflict? What do I stand for? What drives me? Emotionally, where am I at? Am I wound up in self-promotion, pride, self-protection, fear? Am I chasing my old job performance and the approval of others, or am I dedicated to a cause and a relationship, which is my people in the community? Physically, where am I at? I'm not the combat challenge guy anymore. I'm not that guy. Hip replacement, foot surgery, and back surgery. I'm out. I got the memories in a t-shirt. Okay? But I still have to take time to be fit and set an example for my people. Spiritually, I'm a man of faith. I make no apologies for it. Just like people without faith make no apologies for their belief system. But what I'm recommending for you today is find a belief system. Find what works for you. Identify the values personal in your company and in your fire department. Understand what the mission is and make it your own and own it. Because when the storms of life tear you down, what's beneath the surface is going to allow you to rebuild yourself stronger than ever. That foundation that we all need. It's been an honor and privilege spending the past hour with you. Thank you so much. If there's anything I can ever do, please call on me.